Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Caroline Woods. Thanks so much for joining us. Today we're talking about using a gender lens to invest and why doing so might yield better returns. For this conversation, I'm joined by Morgan Stanley's Head of Investing with Impact, Emily Thomas. Emily, thanks so much for joining us. Really excited to have this conversation with you. Caroline, so excited to be here and to be here with all of you uh, watching. Thank you for having me. Yes, and before we actually begin, I just want to remind everyone, we want to hear from you. So please take the poll and leave any questions for Emily in the chat. We'll get to as many of those as we can, and we want to make sure that we're answering the questions that you have. But Emily, let's kick things off, I think, really just simply. And that's, you know, when we talk about ESG investing, oftentimes there's this really heavy focus on the E but today we're actually going to focus on the S. So instead of environmental, we're going to focus on social. And I think a good place to start is just what is investing with a gender lens and why is it important? No, it's a, a great question. So gender lens investing, you know, at a, a high level is really just considering gender diversity in the investment process. So whether that's looking at diversity at the asset managers you're investing with or the actual companies you're investing in. Um, and, you know, I think as we'll talk about, I know throughout the, the conversation today, again, it can potentially lead to, you know, better performance and diversification, but also, you know, potentially advance something that you feel good about and, you know, help align your portfolio to your values. Well, we definitely want to talk about the returns and the impact. But before we do, if I'm an investor, how do I identify investments through a gender lens? Kind of walk us through it, if you will. Yeah. So just, you know, maybe putting a finer point to that higher level definition, the way we think about it at Morgan Stanley is we have a framework and how we, we call our framework the three eyes of impact. Um, so intentionality influence and inclusion. And I'll, I'll walk you through those and paint a picture for you kind of as we go through it. So intentionality, that can look like restricting out companies with poor gender diversity uh, characteristics or, you know, investing in solutions. So companies that are proactively considering, you know, gender diversity um, as a way to advance equity, but also, you know, alleviate inequalities. Uh, some examples may include providing access to capital or uh, investing in education for girls or healthcare for women. Um, so that's the first eye, intentionality. Then you can think about influencing companies. So we recognize, you know, there's no such thing as a, a perfect company. So investors can actually work with companies to help them improve along dimensions around diversity and inclusion. Um, so this can look like engaging with companies to disclose on their diversity uh, data points. We know there's a lack of, of data around diversity out there, but it can also look like encouraging companies to include more diverse uh, diversity on their boards and in senior leaderships. Or one of our uh, asset managers that we partner with actually recently engaged with one of the biggest tech companies out there to end forced arbitration. And so, you know, it was a group of investors who came in and said, this is a practice that hurting employees and, and creating greater inequality and, and potentially, you know, making it more uh, not as not as uh, interesting for, for new employees to join. And so for bottom line performance, it was something important for the company to consider. And, and the final approach, um, inclusion. So this is actually focusing on diversity of the asset manager itself. And we know that less than 1.5% of assets in the US are managed by diverse owned firms. That's a huge discrepancy right there. And so we know there are historic and, and continue to be barriers for diverse owned firms to gain access and to gather capital. And so we you know, very intentionally are focused on removing those barriers and, and providing greater access to our clients, but also to those firms to, to access potential dollars. Emily, I, I'm just looking at the poll results, and it seems like the majority of people that have answered so far haven't even considered investing through a gender lens, which uh, I, I think that's really great because they're obviously probably learning so much right now from this conversation. So just more specifically, I, I'm curious how investors are really implementing this 
strategy into their portfolios? Is it just a matter of finding, uh, you know, some of the points that you mentioned in terms of funding or women in leadership roles or board seats, or is there a scoring system for companies? How are they finding these actual investments? Yeah, well, I mean, just first, again, it's a great place to be to say you haven't thought about it before and to be joining today. I think first, just asking the questions. I think that's just step number one. So when you're looking to invest, asking about diversity at the firms you're investing with, um, again, asking if they consider diversity in the investment process. Um, and I think we're seeing more investors start to, you know, ask these questions, which is exciting. Um, at the same time, I think we're seeing more opportunities come to light. And so there are there are a number of scoring methodologies out there, whether it's looking again at diversity at boards or um, looking at you know diversity at, at companies more broadly. Um, and so I think you can look at like we have what's called the the HER score um, at, at Morgan Stanley, but there. A number of other ones out there. But I think you can also just, again, ask those questions and just to maybe shine a uh, or put a finer point on on an example, you know, thinking about if you're investing in financial services, we know that, you know, women represent the majority of unbanked adults globally. So are the financial services companies you're working with considering this? Are they, you know, uh, investing uh, or supporting um, women gaining access to finance, such as bank accounts or supporting inclusion, um, you know, more broadly at their firm, which can be, you know, again, good for women, good for diversity, but also just, you know, good as a growing business opportunity as well. I see we have a question from Suzanne. She's a, a woman approaching retirement from New York City, no dependents. How would she invest differently? Uh, yeah, I, it's a great question. So I, I think, especially as we think about retirement accounts, um, which I, I know where much of uh, the majority of people's assets sit, you know, I think we oftentimes just click a button when we first join a company and it's a diversified portfolio, and then we, we let it sit there. So I think, you know, the, the difference is knowing what you own. And so maybe asking the question, you know, there are a number of funds out there that are very focused on on gender. And so that could be something you consider as part of it. Um, and but they're also just, you know, thinking about who are the portfolio managers at the funds that you're invested in, who are, you know, the CEOs and the board members of the asset managers you're you're partnering with. And so I think it can look different depending on what, you know, is important to you. But I think the first step is just asking those questions and then starting to think, okay, well, maybe I'll, you know, put aside a little bit of money over here and invest in a gender focused strategy, or maybe I'll, you know, put aside money over here and make sure that I'm investing in diverse owned asset managers or women owned asset managers. Um, and I think, but again, just starting with those questions is, is really key. Keep those questions coming. We definitely want to hear from you. And Emily, I think you've done a really good job of explaining what gender lens investing is and maybe how to find those investments. But I think let's talk about the why. Obviously, there's a positive societal impact. But is this a, you know, does this return yield better returns? The answer, you know, is is. Yes, um, I think, you know, studies show that balance in, in representation can can help broaden perspectives and drive better decision making across organizations of all sizes, um, you know, and so according to uh, our HER score, the uh, in Morgan Stanley research, uh, we've actually seen this play out in practice. So between uh, 2011 and 2022, um, companies that have taken a holistic approach toward equal representation and so have greater representation um, have outperformed their less diverse peers by actually 1.2% per year. Um, so that's, that's actually a pretty big difference um, that, that we're seeing. So I do think that we do see that that change. And I, I, I think there's, you know, it, it makes sense. Like if you have a company that's more inclusive, more diverse, you're likely going to have greater employee satisfaction. So you're going to have less turnover, you're going to have, you know, you're, you'll be able to retain those that top talent, you'll be able to recruit more diverse talent, because if you have diverse talent, it's easier to use their networks to then recruit that diverse talent and think about a broader pool. Um, we also see that it can 
promote innovation. You know, if you have everyone looks the same and is the same around a table, you may not think about certain aspects of opportunities for the business. And so bringing in those diverse perspectives can be really powerful. And then avoiding reputational risk. I mean, we're seeing it's more and more important to society broadly to think about diversity. And, and we're seeing, you know, headlines uh, around lack of diversity or lack of inclusive practices. And so I think the more that we have women at senior leadership levels, the more that companies can, can be able to at least be aware of, of potential risks, but also those opportunities. We have a great question from Deanna. She says, is there a website or platform that shows a comprehensive list of gender focused funds to invest in? I'm often strapped for time to do in-depth analysis and research. She uses Elvest right now. So I think that, uh, you know, many people might be thinking, I want to do this, but it's going to take a lot of time to Google, you know, who who is at the top and, you know, which companies have the most women in their board seats and are, you know, have the best maternity leave, that type of thing. So where should they go? Yeah, well, I will say Morgan Stanley does have, you know, we have a list of diverse owned firms. We have a list of strategies that are aligned um, in terms of their investment approach. Um, you know, I think others, you know, I think Elevis does, does a great job as well. Um, a, a big fan of, of Sally Krawcheck's. Um, I think you know, PAX Global Environmental, uh, sorry, PAX, uh, Elevate Fund, uh, which is focused on, on women's leadership, uh, is another one that's very focused on gender diversity in the investment process. And so I think there's more and more uh, data available, um, but agree, it's, you know, I think it, it, does, it does take a little bit of, of that work. And so I, again, just any time, like if you have a financial advisor, you know, and you're, or you're again looking at your retirement lineup, like I think asking the questions, because by asking the questions and not just doing the research on your own, I think you're showing others that this matters to you. Um, and I think that that's showing the demand and, and increasing the pressure to for others, to whoever's, you know, maintaining the portfolio of investment opportunities for uh, 401k plans or, you know, for your own personal investments to be thinking about this as well. So I would just, you know, again, I know I've, I, I, I may sound like a broken record, but I encourage you also to just ask, ask your financial advisor, ask your company um, and, and, and let them do some of the light work as well. Diane says, what about how to find smaller companies that are really hip to social impact as well as clever investment strategies? What do you think, Emily? Yeah, so I mean, we've seen a lot of interesting like questions around like B Corps too. Um, I think we, so, so the way Morgan Stanley works is, you know, for, so just to share my perspective, like we're an open architecture platform. And so we work with asset managers, many different asset managers and, I think one thing that, that can be helpful if you're really looking for that innovative approach is to work with an asset manager that's taking an intentional approach. Because, right, we don't necessarily have time to find the most innovative woman-owned firm out there um, and, and think about the risks and opportunities. But it's like maybe putting a little bit of that upfront research into um, either the financial advisor you work with or putting uh, you know, that thought process into the asset managers you're partnering with can help ensure that that's an intentional part of, of the investment approach. Um, but I, you know, agree, I'll just echo kind of the question. I think sometimes it is smaller companies that are able to do really innovative, creative work um, and also, you know, ensure that, that diversity is a core part of their um, business from, from the get-go. What's next? How do you see this strategy of investing evolving? Does it become as common as investing in, say, tech stocks, if you will, because I'll be honest, you know, I typically work from the floor of the stock exchange, talk about the markets all day, throw around the word ESG or the, the, the phrase ESG quite a bit, but usually I'm focused on environmental. So don't, you know, talk as much about gender lens investing. Is this going to be just kind of an everyday term that we start to use down the road? You know, I hope so, but I uh, I feel like we're 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 maybe a little ways off from that, and so I think what 
in terms of what's next, I, I think increasingly we do see demand from investors to know what they own. And so in the same way you get financial performance on a regular basis, you know, you may want to know, like, I what is the impact that I'm having? Because no matter what, you're having an impact with your investments. And so ensuring that impact aligns with with what's important to you. I think increasingly we're seeing that demand. So, you know, again, at, at Morgan Stanley, the way we think about this is, is through impact reporting. And many, many of our asset managers um, do impact reporting. But we also, you know, have our own internal capabilities called Morgan Stanley Impact Quotient. And it allows our, our clients to really see almost an x-ray basically of their portfolio and how aligned it is to their, you know, to their values. And so if that's gender lens, you can see, you know, what percent of the portfolio is invested in companies with diverse boards or with pay equity or, um, you know, with, with parental leave stra- uh, capabilities or, um, you know, resources. And so I think without data, we can't, you know, we don't know what to ask for. And we also can't measure success. Um, And so I think the more that we see data, the more that we see policy push for data, um, you know, I know, governments have done a lot of work. uh, And um, we've seen NASDAQ do some really interesting work to encourage uh, diversity and, and disclosure of diversity data. Uh, I think that the more that we see that, you know, and data come to light, the more that we will see, I think, investors saying, hey, this is something I care about and and I'm able to take action. But also, you know, this is just good, good for my portfolio. I'm curious, what is driving momentum right now? Is it investor demand? Is it the regulatory landscape? Uh, what is it that's driving this demand at this point? Yeah. So I think it's both. I think Yes, I mean, we clearly have seen a broader societal shift and a greater focus on diversity and inclusion. I think, you know, as we look to the next generation, uh, you know, of of, of new new workers coming into the workplace, I think it's something really important to them. I think we do see employees that are going to their firms and saying, how, you know, do you, what are your inclusive practices? How are you thinking about diversity? What are your, you know, goals around that? Um, and, and so I think that broader societal shift is, is part of it, but then you also see policy changes, which increases data and increases the, the um, investment opportunity set. And I think you also see, and, and so along those lines, you see investors recognizing that, that they can have an impact through their investments. And so looking back at 2022, you know, we saw um, many more what are called shareholder proposals or, or resolutions, which is, you know, when when shareholders or equity holders actually go to companies and and ask for change. And many of and so we saw more in 2022 than in 2021. But many of those were actually focused on, you know, increasing disclosure uh, of diversity metrics or, you know, increasing uh, diversity and um, in senior leadership and greater equity. And so I think that, um, you know, that recognition that that change can happen and that we all play a role, um, I think, is is driving some of this momentum. Diane has a follow up question to your commentary around working with an asset manager to help find some of these investment opportunities. And she says, what is the best process for balancing cost of advisors and making decisions? Yeah. So the way that um, somebody once framed it to me in terms of, you know, the the value add for financial advisors, you know, clearly right now we're seeing some market volatility. And, you know, I, I, we don't I, I don't even, you know, have time to, to, to think about my portfolio on a, on a daily basis necessarily. And so one, you're with an advisor, you have someone who's going to be thinking about your your portfolio on a daily basis, and that is their full time job. Um, and so I think, you know, that's that's one benefit. And then and then second, when the market's down, you know, twenty percent, or you know, when when there when there is that volatility, it's that person who's going to hold your hand a little bit and say, you know, it's okay, because that's actually the time you may want to be putting more money into the market. Um, it could be a great buying opportunity. And so I, I know that's not maybe as direct of an answer to the question about how to balance, you know, our costs and, um, and, and opportunity. But I do 
think that those are some of the benefits to a financial advisor as you're weighing that, that decision. We still have a few minutes left, about four minutes left. So if there are any audience questions, get them in now so we can address those. But I, you know, you talk about a, a down market or, you know, there's just so much uncertainty right now in terms of inflation, interest rates, recession risk. And I think that can cause a lot of concern. Can gender lens investments weather an economic storm? Yeah, so I, I think one of the interesting data points, and this is broad ESG, but one of the interesting data points that 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 we've seen is historically, you know, he, like environmental, social governance factors have actually helped protect on the downside. So when you see that greater volatility in like early 2020, when you saw a lot of volatility in the market, strategies that are considering environmental social governance factors actually held up a little bit better um, than, than their peers. And we've seen that play out over, over other periods as well. And I think one of the reasons for that is these companies are higher quality. Um, they're also investing towards the future and kind of better ready to weather some of those storms in terms of they've got cash on hand um, for, you know, emergencies. They have, uh, you know, paid leave policies for, for employees. They're thinking about that, those diverse perspectives and to, you know, understand risks. And so I, I think that, you know, bringing in diversification, especially with mar uh, market volatility, and so that's diversification of opinions as well, um, can actually be, be potentially beneficial and, and really helpful. Emily, ESG investing, though, has also become this hot button issue. It's increasingly politicized. So what do you think are the biggest misconceptions about sustainable investing right now? And how are you addressing those concerns with some of your clients? Yeah, so I would say the two biggest concerns that I read about, hear about um, are performance and greenwashing. And so I'll, I'll address kind of both of them. So one on performance, you know, I think we've gone over it, you know, the way that we think about ESG investing or, you know, sustainable investing actually is also just a, a deeper understanding of risks and opportunities within companies. So again, you know, we went over with this with, with gender lens, but I, I think that diversity at firms, you know, can, and, and firms that are more inclusive can be uh, a, a benefit for the bottom line. Um, but, and so I think overall, you know, on the, the performance side, it's just, you know, again, that, that deeper understanding of, of those risks and opportunities. And on, on the greenwashing side, I do think an authentic approach is really important um, and, and data. And so, you know, the way that, that I, I think about it at Morgan Stanley for, for our clients is we have, you know, we have over a decade of, of history working in this space and we are able to, you know, over that time, we've built a really strong due diligence approach. So how do we choose funds for our platform? Well, we're looking at, you know, the data that we're using, we're looking at the, or that, that, that asset managers are using, we're looking at who's making the investment decisions, we're looking at, uh, you know, where they they draw the line. So do they, you know, where do they say no? And, and where do they say, uh, you know, yes, based on risks and opportunities from an environmental and social standpoint. Um, but then we also hold them accountable. So again, going back to Morgan Stanley Impact Quotient, our impact reporting capability, we're able to see if the investments aligned um, with those with those objectives, and then ask the asset manager if it's not, you know, what's going on? Maybe they're engaging. Maybe that that their their challenges around the data. So so I think that authentic approach is is really important. But we see so many strategies and opportunities out there that do take that that authentic approach. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but so many important points to consider. Thank you so much, Emily. Thanks, Morgan Stanley. And of course, thanks all of you for joining us.